I, I, I let introduce yourself, uh, Daniel and, and Florence, and, and then we can start the, the presentation. Okay, so then I introduce myself and then Jenil uh, takes the floor. So I'm, I'm Florence Delche, I'm professor at Telecom Paris. We are working uh, on uh, explainability and in general trust, trustworthy uh, AI among other uh, topics. Uh, other topics are structured uh, data and social prediction. Uh, and we are very happy. It's very nice to have invited uh, Jenil to talk today. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so, hello, I'm Janil Parak, and I'm, I'm a third year PhD student at Telecom Paris. Uh, my advisors are Florence and uh, Pablo. Uh, I'm working on designing methods for interpretability of machine learning models. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity uh, here today. Uh, I'll be presenting a framework we developed. So, it's titled Flint. So, yeah, I'll, I'll start the presentation now. So, I mean, the most, uh, uh, I mean, there are many definitions for interpretability, but uh, proposed definitions for interpretability, but the most agreed one is that it's the ability to make uh, the decision process of any system, any AI system, human understandable. Uh, and within machine learning, there are, we could we could divide the literature into addressing two big uh, into two branches so addressing two different types of problems so the first the first is the methods that address uh, post hoc interpretation problem so post hoc interpretation is that someone provides me with a fixed pre trained model uh, that they typically train for accuracy it's not interpretable and now they are asking me to interpret its decisions and the second type of problem is interpretability by design, where in, you want to learn a model which is inherently interpretable and it, and it gives a good performance. So that's the goal. Uh, and we proposed uh, a framework, Flint, which, which learns a pair of networks. So it's applicable for uh, space of neural networks. So it learns two networks, a predictor and an interpreter. Uh, and it can address both problems. So it's primarily designed to address the second problem, interpretability by design. But a special case of the framework that I'll present, it's applicable for post hoc interpretations as well. So again, just to remind, post hoc interpretation is when a pre-trained model is given to us. And in the second problem by design, you, you want to uh, learn a model which is by design interpretable, inherently, inherently interpretable. And before uh, I, I discuss the, I mean, just to complete the introduction uh, and before going into the details, there are a couple of key aspects of Flint. So one is that it's the way it gives, provides interpretation is in terms of high level features, high level attributes, which uh, which essentially capture concepts. So that's the means, they, they could be very different types of means. Uh, and the second aspect is it can provide both local interpretation and global interpretation. So local is the case when you want to have the interpretation or insights for just a single sample, just in the locality of a sample. And global interpretation is when you want to understand the model as a whole globally. Uh, and just to see what are the related directions to Flint and, and this list is kind of now I would, I would say outdated a bit. Uh, so th there are like some works which jointly learn a predictor and interpreter, but uh, it's it's very different. For example, this method it learns a local interpreter for interpreter for each sample. Uh, the second the second related direction is when the methods that use concepts for interpretation. There were a couple of methods that were proposed before us that. Uh, had given this idea of using concepts for interpretation. Uh, in this direction, I think now the literature is has advanced a lot. So it, it has become very popular recently, like uh, in the past, I would say one year. So yeah, so the second, the list in the second point is kind of outdated, but these were the methods uh, which were like related to us in this direction at, at the time we did the work. And the third, 
as I discussed that the framework is applicable for both by design and post hoc problems. Uh, I think still, still uh, as of now, I haven't seen any other work which can which tackles both. Uh, so that's one one interesting aspect of uh, the framework. So yeah, now I'll introduce, I'll formulate the problem, and then we'll dive into the more de details uh, of it. Uh, so we introduce a task, the uh, uh, gen generic task SLI, which is supervised learning with interpretation, and we consider prediction and interpretation as two separate tasks. And for each of these tasks, we have a dedicated model. So we have a model F for the prediction task and a model G for the interpretation task. And this is the optimization problem we formulate. Uh, there are two loss terms, a prediction loss, which only concerns F, and there's an interpretation loss, which concerns F and G. Uh, and the important detail here is that G, the interpreter, is actually dependent on F. So G is from a family of interpreter models which are related to F. How they're related, I'll describe it in more detail. Uh, and F is from the space of all the prediction models we have. Uh, and we address this SLI problem when the space of predictor models is the, uh, the set of deep neural networks. And we are concerning ourselves only to the task of multi-class classification. Uh, even more specifically in our experiments, we mainly deal with image recognition, but yeah. But these are, these are all very general aspects of the framework. And as I said, a special case of the framework we have uh, is when someone provides us with a fixed pre-trained model. So in that case, we basically fix this F to some F hat and only learn G. In the case of by design, we will learn both F and G and here, F is fixed and we only learn optimize with G with respect to G uh, and only the interpretability loss term. Uh, right. So now going into the uh, more details. So how exactly interpreter is related to F and uh, how the system is operating. So we have our predictor F. Uh, it's a deep neural network. So I'm indicating all these layers, F1, F2, so on and the output is fx. The interpreter would be indicated in red. So the, uh, so it starts, the interpreter starts by accessing intermediate layers of F, certain intermediate layers of F. These are typically towards the latter layers to towards the end because they capture high level features, but interpreter uh, accesses intermediate layers of F. It processes them through a function psi and this output of function psi is this f uh, phi of phi of x. So the equation of interpreter is given here. So it's h composed with psi composed with fi of x. So fi of x denotes the intermediate layers. These are composed with this function psi operated by function psi. The output of function psi is phi of x, and this phi of x is further processed by this function h. In our case, this H is, uh, it's just a linear layer. So it's characterized by a weight matrix and then, then a softmax. Uh, and the key, uh, I mean, really the heart of this whole framework is this representation phi of X. And this phi of X is our dictionary of uh, attribute functions. I'll refer to each individual attribute function as just attribute. Uh, and can, each can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah sure uh just uh how do you do you fix i actually here you you say that it's three six nine but can it be other or do you do you have a, a rules to to fix i or uh okay so it's it's basically how we choose the intermediate layers just, i mean i can rephrase your question in that way uh so i i could be other things uh and i think the more the intermediate layer, uh, intermediate layers we use, uh, it can, the model should perform better. But uh, there's also this idea that uh, you're not really interested in choosing the earlier layers. Here, for example, if I'm actually uh, like training this model, I'm not as so interested in F3. Uh, it has much lower level features compared to F9. So. For example, F6, F9, I mean, I would probably go for something like this. Uh, 
it's uh, it's not uh, a it's not a well defined or something theoretical that we can offer that how to choose the intermediate layers but there are some practical considerations that you can do so you don't want uh, i mean the more intermediate layers you use the larger the model uh, you know gets so uh, it's like we go for two or three intermediate layers at most and they do, those are chosen from towards the end uh, also another practical consideration choosing two intermediate layers which are very uh, like close to each other like f8 or f9 it's not it, it won't add much to the uh, learned uh, representation uh, but yeah so i think there's a lot of choice, choices that you could make but make but uh, the practical considerations basically filter down to a small subset uh, which is sensible i, I don't know if, if if that answers enough your yeah, yeah, okay. yes okay thanks Right. So uh, this attribute, this dictionary of attribute functions, that's the uh, that's the most critical part. Uh, we want uh, right. So I didn't describe it fully. So uh, I'll refer to each attribute function as just attribute. It's a function over the input space, this phi j, uh, and its output image is uh, non-negative real numbers. And each phi j x. Uh, is an activation of some high level attribute from my input space. That is, it captures some kind of concept over my input space. So uh, this will become much more clear. I mean, in, in the case of images that would correspond to something like a, a head or a leg, a, con a concept from my input space. Uh, that's what each attribute or attribute function phi j captures. Uh, yeah. And there, there are many losses through which we uh, attempt to learn this phi, phi of x very, uh, meaningfully. So I'll describe the losses, the learning part next. Uh, so what are the different losses? So the first is the output fidelity loss, uh, which is simply that we want our interpreter to approximate uh, our predictor well. So it's basically just the cross entropy loss between the two. We want a g of x, which is just h of phi of x to approximate f of x. Uh, the second is that we only want a small number of attributes to activate for any sample. That's the conciseness part. Uh, but we also want many attributes to be used across many samples. So the dictionary shouldn't be uh, use of just, uh, shouldn't underutilize the, uh, I mean, the learning shouldn't under, underutilize the dictionary. Uh, so we want many attributes to be activating for many samples and we use entropy based losses for this. Uh, so in, in this, the, uh, the minimization of entropy for the second term is, uh, promoting conciseness. And the first term is for diversity. Uh, and there's also this L1 regularization, which would be a typical way of, uh, uh imposing sparsity, but and uh, as we will show in the experiments that the entropy loss worked better um, but the elven regularization still helps in stabilizing because entropy is a bit uh, tricky to use so we still require some kind of elven regularization to stabilize it uh, but yeah that's the concise and diversity part and the third part and the third loss is the input fidelity loss uh, it is so that these attributes should uh, uh, I mean, each uh, attribute function should capture some meaningful high-level pattern from the input. So to simulate this, we go for this autoencoder type of uh, autoencoder loss. So the phi of x is processed by a decoder d, and it, it tries to reconstruct back the input x. So th there's a reconstruction loss. That's the input fidelity loss. So uh, yeah, the complete interpretability loss term. It's it's a linear combination of these three losses, uh, and the prediction loss is just our standard cross entropy loss. So that is the learning part of the system. Uh, and the next question is like, when, once you've learned, how do you get the interpretations? So I, I'll divide it into two parts. So uh, so the two parts is. First, identifying the important attributes, and the second part is understanding those attributes. But let's start with this. How, how, so the question is, how do we get local or global interpretability from this trained system? And there are three, uh, there are three, the three sub 
modules or sub parts with or three simple easy steps so the first is that if i provide someone with a sample x uh, and there could be multiple ways of doing this but one of the ways you can very easily estimate some kind of local importance of an attribute in prediction of a sample so that's the uh, local relevance rjx so it's uh, indexed by the attribute uh, the attribute index j for sample x uh, and you can estimate this by i mean we estimate this by uh, normalizing the contribution of an attribute j with respect to all other attributes so it's just activation of the attribute multiplied by the weight its weight for the predicted class and it's just normalized between uh, minus 1 to 1 uh, if you can estimate the local relevance or local importance of an attribute for a sample x then you can extend this notion to uh, some kind of global relevance you average out rjx for a set of samples which have the same predicted class so this will give in, give give us an idea of how important an attribute j is in prediction of class c so that's uh, rjc so uh, indexed by the attribute index and the class uh, it's just the average of rjx for a set of samples with predicted class c uh, and yeah the third part uh, as i said it's uh, uh, to understand the concept uh, or to understand the attributes what concept is encoded by each attribute so the the first two uh, first two steps will basically provide you with the information that what at attributes are important for a sample or for a class in general and the third the third step is basically to to try and understand what is, what is the concept or what's the meaning of an attribute what it has learned yeah so 1 plus 3 basically gives us local interpretability and 2 plus 3 is global interpretability so yeah the, the last step is in this slide so how do we understand the concept encoded by any attribute so we divide into an algorithmic uh, an algorithm so the, the steps uh, for this so we start by computing the global relevance the global relevance of each attribute for each class c so rjc then we identify the important class attribute pairs by thresholding rjc so it gives us a set of relevant class attribute pairs and we analyze each pair by repeating a procedure this procedure basically relies on uh, trying to uh, visualize what are the patterns that highly activate an attribute so they, they could again there could be multiple ways that uh, people could do this uh, what we go for is first selecting samples of class c that maximally activate phi j and and just to remind you we basically are now trying to analyze one class attribute pair when we are repeating this procedure so we select sample of class c which maximally activate phi j these are the maximum activating samples so uh, mas just visualizing them can give us a good amount of information of what this attribute phi j actually captures about class c uh, and then we further dig more to further understand better phi j uh, by using an activation maximization so it's, it's popular in computer vision activation maximization uh, as a visualization tool uh, so what we do is we optimize our input to maximally activate phi j uh, that would be activation maximization it's just a very slight modification that we also initialize this uh, from uh, the particular image that we will be analyzing but that's the basic idea behind activation maximization you want to optimize your input to maximally activate a neuron a group of neurons in this case phi j and this will give us a good idea about what patterns are uh, so what patterns activate phi j basically what does it detect so yeah we uh, i think uh, uh, it will become more clear when i give uh, show the example but activation max this uh, am plus pi tool can also be used uh, when we have local interpretations. Uh, now it's uh, now, I, now I'll move towards the experiments. Uh, if, if there are any questions until now, uh, I'll wait for a couple of seconds. If if not, 
right so for the experiments uh, we basically tried uh, so a couple of data sets with smaller networks so learn it uh, for i mean it's it, all these experiments are image recognition uh, image classification uh, as a problem so mnist and fashion mnist with learn it and we tried few exp uh, experiments with resnet 18 a larger network larger cnn on safar 10 and quick draw so quick draw is a hand sketch recognition data set uh, i think from google uh, and it's it's a much larger data set we select a subset of 10 classes so this, so these are the classes we try to select a good mix um, and then we additionally also so th these are all still smaller scale images uh, safar 10 and quick draw are much more difficult than mnist or fashion mnist uh, so also justifies the need of larger network uh, but they're still smaller scale uh, and then so we also tested a method uh, or validated its applicability on larger data sets so safar 100 and cub 200 cub 200 is a bird classification data set right uh, i'll describe the evaluation there there there's a quantitative evaluation there's a, a subjective evaluation in quantitative evaluation they they basically we we uh, evaluate each of our losses or each of our components so these are our three metrics in accuracy we need to we hope to confirm two goals so first is that the accuracy of our prediction network that we learn uh, it's comparable or it's uh, it's comparable to other interpretable architectures neural network uh, interpretable neural network architectures uh, and also we want to confirm that training the predictor and interpreter jointly does not negatively affect the predictor's performance uh, compared to if, if I just remove the interpreter and just train the pre predictor normally compared to that we hope or it, we hope that uh, jointly training the interpreter it does not uh, even if it negatively affects it's not a major performance drop that's what we hope uh, the second is the fidelity of the interpreter. So basically, what is the agreement between uh, G and F? So the fraction of samples where its output is same as F, G's output is same as F. Uh, the third is the conciseness of interpretation. So it basically, uh, so conciseness, is, conciseness would be that how, for any given sample, you want to analyze as fewer attributes as possible, if they're all understandable. So you want, uh, so we propose this metric for this to compute conciseness. And it is simply that if I give us, give someone a sample X and they tell me the relevances, uh, how many number of attributes have relevance greater than some threshold. And I want this to be as few as possible because, uh, whatever this set uh, the size of this set CNS GX would be that's that would be the number of attributes I have to analyze. So it's more favorable if it's smaller. Yeah, so th these are the results. Uh, the flint, the base F, the first column is the predictor trained without the interpreter. So the predictor trained normally. Uh, then there are two baselines uh, in the second, third column. The fourth column is the accuracy of the predicted and the fifth column is the accuracy of the interpreted. So, I mean, the, the goals that we had, they, they're basically confirmed. So there's not a large negative drop in the first and the fourth column and Flint F accuracy is also comparable. Even Flint G accuracy is comparable with the other baselines or even better. And there's a table, uh, I mean, the second table is for the fidelity. So what's the agreement between G and F? So, uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, uh, we selected the second baseline that that's our primary baseline, I would say, uh, which also has a single model that, that tries to approximate the, uh, predictor. So yeah, the fidelity is also quite great. There's one important comment that I would like to make regarding fidelity. So uh, 
there is an advantage of flint over the other two baselines uh, in terms of fidelity and that comes because the interpreter accesses hidden layers of f and that's not something present in the other two models so you could say that the comparison is not fair but at the same time it also points out that uh, the use of hidden layers could be very helpful regarding this it could really help uh, i mean yeah because the interpreter has the access of intermediate output so its job is much easier uh, yeah and this is the conciseness uh, plots so what we do is we calculate this uh, this cn uh, cns uh, for the interpreter g average it over all samples x uh, so we average out the cns g comma x over all over the test set we vary the th threshold and we just plot plot it uh, we compare our conciseness with the the baseline sen uh, and uh, it's basically basically it's much more concise than send that's the takeaway for the left plot and for the right plot uh, we basically plot the difference of what happens when we use entropy based losses compared to when we don't use entropy based losses so the conciseness even without using entropy the conciseness is not bad but with entropy the conciseness becomes even better okay uh, now the uh, how the global interpretations or how the local interpretations look like in practice and I'll, I'll go through that part uh, then we'll discuss the subjective variation so i'm not i, I don't think i'm running late it's okay it's, uh, 35, no, it's, so it's okay you have fine okay so uh, the left plot is basically uh, i basically pl plotted rjc for one data set so for any data set you you can get this you'll get something like this depending on number number of class and number of attributes uh so yeah it's just showing rjc so and each bright spot is uh is a class attribute pair which has a high value so uh depending upon what threshold you decide so we basically have to analyze each of these bright spots each of the class attribute pairs which have a uh, high relevance and on the right we have visualizations of such class attribute pairs uh for each attribute i've plotted uh for each class attribute pair uh, i've basically uh, shown the three top maximum activating samples and the three corresponding activation uh, maximization visualizations for those and the two things that i want to i basically want to highlight how how one can use these maximum activating samples or am plus pi to understand the attributes so an easier example for example the top one on cfr 10 so the attribute phi2 it activates on dog and the maximum activating samples already give us a lot of information of what uh, what part of dog or i mean of what type of dogs it activates on so all these are white colored all these are uh, i mean all small puppies colored white and in in the active uh, so that's uh, yeah that's the information given by maximum activating sample and am plus pi it can give a further insight into what parts have been emphasized so when the input was optimized what part of these input images was emphasized so basically you'll notice the emphasis on the facial region around the eyes and nose so that part of the facial regions is the most emphasized the other other details get lost uh, so yeah so these two tools can give insight into what is captured by an attribute the second example it's on fashion mnist we have an attribute 524 it activates for all these classes coat shirt pullover all these are similar looking classes uh, so we don't get much information from uh, maximum activating samples they're still they're still helpful uh, but in the activation maximization, you'd see that the arms are the emphasized regions. The other details are lost. And even more so, uh, the long sleeves are uh, even copied. So you'll see multiple vertical strokes uh, around the place where long sleeves are supposed to be. So that's a very clear indicator that's detecting the sleeves in these images. And the third example uh, on quick draw, we have 5.5 five, activating for dog and lion these classes don't immediately seem very similar um, but the activation maximization uh, 
visualizations they'll they give a picture they give a good picture of exactly what the attribute is detecting so it's detecting the same pattern across all these images in the case of dog it, it basically corresponds to roughly corresponds to the ears or the mouth uh, in in case of uh, lion it, it's part of the mane that's i mean that's typically how people have drawn the lion uh, one example from uh, the large scale data set so i mean i'll show the full image of this 5120 but to highlight uh, how to read the uh, activation maximization visualizations in these cases uh, it's kind of similar to the sleeve example so 5120 basically activates for blue headed birds and what you'll see in these uh, the activation maximization is the right one this is just visualization in one sample you'll see the blue head blue headed birds being copied all over the image. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why this uh, image is not so clean. Uh, it's quite pixelated, but I mean, you can still make out uh, the blue heads which are copied, yeah, uh, at multiple places. And this is the uh, this is the more detailed visualization of 520. So I mean, it constantly activates for blue-headed birds, and you'll constantly see. Uh, when optimizing the image, it will place blue head blue heads all over the uh, input. And local interpretation, it's uh, I mean, it's, uh, so in both type of interpretations, the understanding of attribute is the common part. So uh, it, it's just some you could consider this as some kind of extension. Uh, so when when I have an input image. From the local relevances, I, I can plot the local relevances, which will give me what attributes are important in the prediction. So for example, for this, uh, it's an image of a cow. I have three attributes, uh, which were greater than my threshold, 5, 15, 22, and six. And what I, be, uh, so the process I repeat is, I see what understanding I have about 550. So the global interpretation about 550, uh, you'll, be, you'll see uh, the emphasized vertical strokes. Uh, across all these classes, it basically detects the legs. Uh, and similarly for the other two attributes for 522, it emphasizes the blotted textures in cows or for grapes. Uh, and 56, it detects strokes, uh, horizontal strokes about, uh, about for the body. So you combine the information about local relevance and the understanding developed for each attribute. Uh, okay, so now we are moving towards the end, just the subjective evaluation part, and then I, I'll move towards, uh, I'll go to the conclusion. We conduct this subjective evaluation to evaluate if the attribute visualizations we have are meaningful to the normal uh, viewer. So we had 20 participants and we selected 10 attributes, uh, which, which is like, I think, 60 or 70% of the total class attribute pairs from the quick draw. And what we did was we showed the participants a visualization, visualization of an attribute and uh, a textual description uh, from about the understanding we developed uh, of what we understand from the attribute. And for each attribute, the participants were asked to indicate whether they agreed or disagreed that the description meaningfully associates to the visualization or describe the yeah, so the visualization and description are related. So yeah, they they had the options of strongly agree to strongly disagree or don't know. And for forty percent descriptions, we uh, we manually added forty percent incorrect descriptions so that it doesn't become obvious for the participants to choose uh, just strongly agree or just strongly disagree. Uh, and these were the results. So uh, generally. Uh, for the correct descriptions, the participants were able to identify uh, that, yeah, the description meaningfully associ associates to the visualization. Uh, and for the incorrect descriptions, they were also generally able to identify that, okay, it's, it does not make sense uh, with the visualization. And uh, yeah, this is just kind of a cursory slide. So we also evaluated the post hoc interpretations, uh, evaluated the fidelity and the conciseness. So and I, I'm both of both of them are good. Uh, yeah. 
So in summary, we proposed a framework jointly learns a predictor and an interpreter. Uh, the interpreter can provide local interpretability and global interpretability in terms of high level attributes, high level attribute functions. Uh, it can, the framework can address both problems, the by design and the post hoc, uh, the by design problem and the post hoc problem. One uh, possible use of Flint is if we, I mean, it's, it's a slightly different direction if uh, compared to the original framework I started with, but uh, to pursue this direction, you don't really have to change anything that has been proposed uh, until now. Uh, that you retain just the interpreter as the final model you will use for prediction. And after training, you throw away uh, F and just retain G. So it can be a model of reduced complexity and it's basically fully faithful to itself. Uh, I, I know we haven't really explored much the question of faithfulness. It, it's an important uh, concept for interpretability. Uh, but yes, we have this option that we only keep the interpreter as a final model. Even in this case, the prediction network, the predictor network is not all useless. It still helps during the learning to provide good representations for uh, the interpreter. Then, I mean, there are many future directions to explore here. And I would say some of them uh, have to some extent not been explored in, uh, with respect to this framework itself. Uh, but yeah, for example, the additional cons constraints, uh, they are now other works uh, for concept learning, which have different types of constraints. Uh, but there are loads of possibilities here. You could have some new constraints to encourage stability or invariance to certain transformations. Uh, the, yeah, so there are a lot of possibilities for this. Uh, faithfulness, so, so the faithfulness is basically that the features that we identify through the interpreter as being important uh, were truly the features that were used by the predictor. That's the concept behind faithfulness. So it's not obvious in this case to study its evaluation and it's not uh, obvious for the concept-based approaches, so that requires uh, some work. That's an interesting direction. And there's also this idea that arises here that uh, it's better if we can compare concept-based models to uh, these pixel importances based models, the saliency map based models. So there's also this direction of trying to compare methods which have different types, different means of exp uh, interpretation. And the last uh, uh, is the pipeline or the the attribute design that i discussed it's basically uh, it's mainly useful for image recognition or for image as the uh, input uh, there's also the possibility of uh, extending the frame to other types of data modality audio video graphs text uh, for audio i mean we have uh, we have also addressed this uh, interpretability problem for audio data uh, yeah i haven't covered it today and yeah, there's also a possibility to uh, extend for different types of models, graph CNNs or uh, structured prediction models, etc. Uh, and in all of these, I think the key idea is that we use the broad uh, structures that I described uh, when I formulated the problems, but we redesign how we generate interpretations. We de redesign the representation that we learn. We still access the hidden layers, but we learn different kinds of representations for it. Uh, and it and it correspondingly revises the constraints we use to learn or how we understand the representation or the interpretation. So yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I think I took, I, I went slowly, uh, but I thought we had enough time. Uh, uh, thanks to listening to me. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seen the, the. Oh, okay. The town maybe like to a message. Thank you. Oh, my, my micro was mute. Um, uh, th thank you very much, Janil. Um, do you have any question regarding uh, the presentation with Janiel? Celine or Victoria, you have any question?
Uh, I have one question. Uh, how how you fix the number of uh, attributes? Uh, yes. So it's again. I can't provide some kind of theoretical bound or something like that. It's more uh, based on practical considerations. So one consideration is uh, how many classes we have. Another is uh, what's the complexity of the data set we have. Uh, and one kind of upper bound you can put is that you don't want, suppose, uh, more than 100 or 200 attributes. So you you put a, upper, a cap on that. So that can be one way of uh, limiting your number of choices. Uh, for our case, for example, uh, we basically went, uh, and also if you use too few attributes, your losses would not optimize well. So uh, just from the law, just from observing the losses, you, you'll get the idea that I have to use some enough number of attributes. Uh, so that would be your lower bound basically. Uh, and there would be a big range where things would uh, work normally and they would be not, uh, it's like uh, to optimize, to, to get the optimal point, it's not obvious, but you have a big range where things are working just fine. Uh, in, in our case, I mean, I can just describe, uh, just give you the, what type of values we had. So for, for the easier data sets for MNIST fashion MNIST, we kept uh, around uh, 20, uh, 20 or 25 attributes, something like this. I don't know why I'm forgetting. I've forgotten all the values. Uh, for the more difficult data sets, we had a bit higher number, I think close to 30 or something. Uh, for CUB, uh, I think we had something like 150 because there are a lot more number of classes now. Uh, but yeah, so th these are, and these are all the practical considerations. You, you have some kind of lower bound, uh, and you also put some kind of manual upper bound and there'll be a big range in which things should work, uh, just fine. So I have another question. Yeah. Um, you showed the slide where there was the graph with the classes and uh, the attributes. You know, these. So for example, we see uh, there are some attributes which are not highlighted, uh, right? I guess oh, every, okay. class, every yes. class has an yes, attribute yes. which is highly highlighted and some attributes are not highlighted at all, I guess, for uh, so let's say 12, for instance, yes. 12 or 17, 18. Uh, I was yes. wondering, does it mean that these attributes are useless and yes. then you could, uh, for, for this uh, data set, you could remove these attributes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, what cool is that, uh, I mean, this is, this also ties down a bit to how many number of attributes we use mm -hmm. in the sense, if I use too many for this case, mm -hmm. I would end up with a lot, many, many useless attributes because I don't really need it for, uh, this data set. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, this could also be used to like uh, filter down the number of the dictionary size we have. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, Final question, if you're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, as for the the, the interpreter and the um, the predictor, they are both learning. Uh, if I uh, yes understood uh, well, so yes. um, it might happen sometimes that uh, models are diverse. For example, there is a divergence in their in their. Um, uh, learning process on data, how how to avoid this kind of uh, problem? Yes, I, I, I did face these problems. Uh, yeah. It is a bit of trial and error. Uh, I mean, if I mean, if just the predictor itself is uh, diverging, then that's that's really out of the scope. I mean, the prediction predictor should be able to train. Uh, but even if the predictor is able to train, there might be some issues that might arise because we have these multiple losses. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean, in practice, what we found a stable solution, which, which worked for all of our data sets. Mm -hmm. So we introduced the losses 
across a few epochs, so across like four or five epochs, we introduced all the losses. So we we always start with the prediction loss, and we uh, uh, yeah. So we started with the prediction loss and the input fidelity loss. Then after like a couple of epochs, we introduced the output fidelity and then the conciseness loss. Uh, we I did see a lot of uh, uh, diverging cases. If I was introducing all the losses simultaneously, so, okay. so for example, one one problem that could arise and that would not be diverging. This is not the diverging case, but the attributes basically go to zero. If, for example, the conciseness loss has too high a weight, which is very unreasonable, but it might arise. If it's too too strong a conciseness loss, it will basically in the very initial iterations it will force all attributes to zero, and then they remain zero forever, which is useless. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in practice, yeah, it is. It is. This is trial and uh, trial and error. But again, there's a big range of possibilities where things work fine. Okay. Thank you. Do, do you have any other questions? Um. Actually, I have. I have one. Um. Do, um, um, have you some um, identify some cases uh, where you can use that uh, in the in the kind of real life? Uh, have you some data set because you you talk about MNIST and uh, and uh, some uh, uh, academic data set? I will say. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you a project or or something to train on on a, in, in a specific field? Uh, uh, or... I would say. Uh... I mean, uh, the case of CUB, uh, that would be the closest data set we have to the real world. They, I mean, and it's, it's, it's basically a subset of ImageNet, uh, but uh, there is no the truly real world data here that I agree on. Uh, yeah, so basically in, in these five or six data sets, there's not a truly real world one. Uh, the last two ones are still quite difficult. They have a lot of complexity, uh, and they are also using. I mean, we are using a, a model. I would like the networks design that we use. Uh, that is still kind of similar to the high performing ones. I mean, there's still there's still a lot of generations for these. Uh, there's net fifty or hundred or even some small mobile net or so on. Uh, yeah. But still, the network architecture is kind of close. No real, not truly real world data set among these. Although okay. I would say for the audio problem that we handle, uh, we do have a real world data. So it's like a raw real world sensor data. But yeah, so it's not really covered here. Okay. No, because my 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 my, my proposal was more to 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 see if there is a, a possibility that uh, through, via data craft we can uh, we can. Uh, um, to find a, a real case uh, among our members, if someone yeah. uh, is interesting by this uh, method, uh, so that's what the, the meaning. So, if you had already a project uh, ongoing and uh, testing that in, in on on the uh, uh, application, then maybe you were not interesting. But if you are interesting, then we can propose uh, via via DataCraft via the club uh to uh to our members if they are they see some application of that and uh, and and if you they want to uh to to be in contact with you to to implement that i don't know if it's interesting you. yes it is interesting to me we, we are in the process of uh, trying to make this an even better uh framework from a learning point of view from the representation learning point of view uh Although we still haven't, uh, we still don't right now have re the real world data sets. So it's definitely interesting to me. I mean, uh, I'll be happy to discuss uh, if there are some possibilities for this. Okay, great. Um, I I don't know if uh, Celine, you uh, you see some uh, some case by, on uh, by uh, your clients, or you can. Uh, uh, apply this kind of method uh, but um, I, I, I think I, I will um, I mean I know that uh, at Vinci you know there are a lot of um, 
of uh, computer vision for uh, for vehicle classification. So at the uh, how do you use that? I don't know. You said it in English, but uh, the the peage on the highway. Tolls. They tolls. Yes. Uh, they are they are trying to uh, to recognize if it's a. Uh, uh, a car or a truck, uh, so it's kind of limited of class, uh, of vehicle class. So that, but um, there are some, there are some tricky, uh, there are some tricky cases uh, uh, yeah. where uh, if you have something on your roof uh, and you are a car, then you can be classified as, as a, a, a truck. And I will be interested in to see what the, the the kind of method and the, and to see the the interpretation that you can do of this uh, this kind of uh, tricky. Uh, right, right. Could be interesting cases. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It, it, it is of great interest for us. Um, uh, so, so Jenny, I, I have to leave for uh, a few minutes. So, did you mention the Idemia project, the Lampid project? Uh, no, I, I just remembered uh, when uh, Xavier was mentioning the car truck one. Uh, I didn't mention. I mean, you, you you can mention if you if you want. Yeah. Okay. So yes, so Xavier, yes, we are interested by uh, uh, use case. Uh, yeah. We have one in uh, our project with. Idemia. Uh, so it's a yeah. it's a problem of uh, detecting um, from images of a driver uh, if he or she uh, has a, um, the sea belt yeah. or is a, uh, a phone. Uh, and what is interesting here is that so the I mean, these are binary uh, binary classifications. So in terms of classification, it's not that hard, but in fact, the images are not of good quality. But it raises uh, very interesting issues in the sense that um, uh, the classes are asymmetric and you, of course, uh, what is important is that if you <laughs> detect that someone, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, is holding a phone. I mean, it's uh, it's an important uh, <laughs> prediction. If you say that, you have to, <laughs> um, you know, to be sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, same also for the seabed, but it's a bit different. So yeah. So in this case, it's a uh, in terms of feature, it's more local feature. So it's not that interesting. I mean, simpler method can uh, also, uh, you know answer to that but there are interesting stuff about um, what do you want to to have uh, in terms of information uh, for an automatic system or for someone who is going to to check that uh, at the end it mm. could be the citizen or you know uh, yeah from the policeman to the citizen and so, mm. yeah issues like that okay and then and, and uh, do, do you have starting on that project or it's just yeah. uh... no no it's an INR project which is now founded and we uh, we search for postdoc currently. okay oh great. <laughs> uh, okay yeah we are um, searching for postdoc um th does anybody have another question or No, then uh, we are just on time. So, um, so thank you very much, uh, Janine. It was really clear. Uh, we will uh, we will share. The, is that possible to share the slides? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, send, I'll share the slides. Okay, then we will uh, we will um, share the slides on our our, uh, our website and um, and uh, we will share also the the video if you don't mind on the the our uh, youtube uh, channel okay no problem yeah okay that's great um thank you very much bye everybody and uh, we have another workshop uh, if you uh, are uh, available on on friday uh it's the all day long and uh, we will uh, 
we will work a lot. It's a, it's a practical workshop. You you will have to code in Python, in Python, and uh, it's a, it's a workshop where you will have to uh, to be uh, uh, in the in the shape or no, in the how do you say that in the skin. in the skin. Yes, thank you, Leon, of of a detective, and to identify biases in a recommender recommender system or and pricing system. So it should be quite a fun uh, workshop, I think. Um, then thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Florence, and uh, and uh, and uh, everybody is welcome on Friday if uh, you are available. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.